Hebrews chapter 5, and well actually, you know what, well, I'm going to read one verse, I'm going to read verse 9 to you first before we start going verse by verse through here. One of the things we've been doing in the book of Hebrews is I'm making sure I point out all the verses that people use to prove uh, that you can lose your salvation in Hebrews and just to show how ridiculous that is. There is no, nothing in Hebrews that teaches you can lose your salvation. So let's look at a verse here, though, that people could use to say, you know, here's proof that you could lose your salvation, which, you know, the dispensationalists would say, you know, that proves uh, that this is a tribulation epistle, you know, that it's for the Jews. It's funny, dispensationalists love Jews so much, but they're really mean to them. They teach them that, you know, they can lose their salvation, and uh, they come up with all these different rules for them that are just ridiculous. But look what it says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. It says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Y'all see that? So th that kind of looks like a work salvation, doesn't it? All that obey him. Why doesn't it say unto all that believe him? Because isn't that what the Bible teaches? I mean, eternal salvation is for all those that believe but here in verse 9, it's to all that obey him. So therefore, dispensations are right. You know, it's in the tribulation, it's faith plus works. You have to endure to the end. I heard Sam Gibbs just yesterday or Monday said it again. He's still on this endure to the end to be saved. I mean, that's been exposed. That is so clear with that. The Bible is teaching there what he to the endurance to the end shall be saved. That's talking about physical salvation. He still hasn't figured it out yet. But that's what happens when you're a dispensationalist. I was listening to a dispensationalist a while back preaching, and you know he's going on, and he, he, he this is the same one who mentioned that Hebrews is a dangerous book. You can get into heresy in there if you're not careful. And he was just like, you know, are any of you in here Jews? And I guess somebody raised their hand. He's like, you're a Jew? I don't think he was expecting that. And he was just like, God speaks to you different, but he expects something from you. And that was all he said. <laughs> I'm thinking... That poor guy, you know, so what does God expect from me? You know, what I got to, you know, what I got to do, that was all he said. God, you know, God speaks to you different and he expects something of you. I, I just, it blew my mind when I heard him say that. I was like, wow, if you say something like that, you better clarify. But I, I don't think he was expecting somebody to say they were a Jew in, in the service, but it happened. But, uh, so we will get back to verse 9, but I wanted to show that to you. And I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to explain that verse to you until we get to the very end. All right? I'm going to let you worry about that. It says right there, you know, sal eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Proving faith plus works. Well, that's ridiculous. So let's go ahead and start reading in verse 1. And it says, well, let's look at the last few verses of chapter 4. Okay, because it kind of leads into chapter 5 and we need to remind ourselves of what it says so in verse 14 it says seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our profession for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted as like as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Okay, that's one of the things a high priest does. And I will barely even scratch the surface tonight of the work of the high priest and all that it represents and how it points to Jesus Christ. I am not an expert in this subject. I, there's a lot more I need to learn on this subject but I'm telling you, we, we're only going to scratch the surface tonight on just all that there is to be learned from the high priest and the office of a high priest and how it represents Jesus Christ. But so notice, though, those last few verses of chapter four, it introduces Jesus as the high priest. And this was something that was about to it was going to cause a lot of questions for Jews. But once this was explained you know, they're going to answer, it, it was going to answer, or that once he gives the answer to this question, it's going to cause them to have more questions, okay? Have you ever seen that before? It's like where you get an answer to one question, but then it causes you to have more questions. And that's about what's, that's what's getting ready to happen in this chapter. He's just told them that Jesus Christ is your high priest. 
Okay, well, that answers certain questions, but, but wait a minute. If you're a Jew, that's going to cause a lot of other questions. Wait, how could Jesus be the high priest? He wasn't from the tribe of Levi. You know, it, there's a lot of questions that was going to, it, it was going to cause. And so he's about to, he's going to kind of answer a big thing here, but then the next chapter, he's kind of answering the questions that came from the one question that was answered. Okay? And he goes into some pretty deep stuff. And it's important that we understand what these things mean. And it's really important that, we're, that we study these things, especially you know, in a world where dispensationalists are all over the place teaching a faith plus works in the tribulation because of verses like Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Well, we can't have that. We need to know what this is talking about. And so sometimes you know, the answer to a question, it does. It creates more questions. And that's what's going on here. The writer of Hebrews, he tells them at the end of this chapter, in order to under, under to, in order to understand everything, we're going to have to dig deep into the scriptures, and so that's what's going to happen in the next chapters. So when it comes to the Bible, there's many things that you're going to read that's going to cause you to have more questions. There's a lot of confusing passages in the Bible, aren't there? When you if you study your Bible. Trying to get an answer to a question, you you might get that answer, but then you're going to have more questions later. That's just part of this book that we've got. And the key to understanding the deep things is you have to first believe the simple things. Okay, you don't necessarily have to even understand the simple things. You just got to believe them. You got to accept them. If you're not willing to have faith in Christ, there's a lot of things you're never going to understand. You've got to get saved before you can understand spiritual things. And so there's first things first, okay? You've got to get these simple things down, and then we can get to the deep things. And so the high priest, let's read a few more verses. So verse 2 uh, says, Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity, and by reason hereof he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So no, notice the high priest. These were people that were called of God and ordained among men. Now, I want you to get this here. I'm gonna, I want to really focus on what we see here in these verses here for just a minute because this actually g plays into what I'm going to be preaching about on Sunday when it comes to judges. In America today, one of the problems with America, people have this attitude, you can be anything you want to be. All right. You ever heard that? You know, you teach your kids. You can be anything you want to be. You know, girls, you can do anything you want. You can be anything you want to be. You know, and there, but there's, there's always been limitations to that. But not in America. Even if you're a girl, you can be a boy if you want to be, a, you know, and if you're a boy, you can be a girl if you want to. And that's just how it is today. You know, and how dare somebody say somebody can't do something just because of their gender? Well, you know, you can't be a husband if you're a woman. You can't be a, uh, a wife if you're a man. You can't be a mother if you're a man. And, you know, you can't be a father if you're a woman. There's just some things you can't do. And there are some positions that are for specific people that not just anybody can have. Okay. And when and on Sunday, we're going to be looking at judges. Okay. Because we're talking about righteous judgment. And when it comes to a judge, somebody who uh, they are, it's a position that is ordained of God. It's a calling of God. It is something that he said, you need to have people that do these things. And those positions are given by men. They are ordained of men and a high priest. It was the same thing too. Not just anybody could be a high priest. Okay. It had to be the high priest was something that was given to Aaron and it belonged to the descendants of Aaron. That was in the old Testament Law of God. It belonged to Aaron and to his descendants. Not just anybody could be the high priest. We see in Judges, and I don't want to get too much in Sunday's message, in Judges there was a man, Micah, who went and he made his own son's priests. He just did what he wanted to do. Everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. We've got people today, they will just declare themselves a pastor and just go start a church, you know, without being under the authority of another church, without being sent out. You know, I can't just declare myself whatever I want to declare myself. There are some things they are ordained of men. I can't decide, you know what? I'm going to be a cop and then just go and give myself a badge and put on a gun and go around arresting people. Okay. That is a position that is ordained of men given by men. Okay. And so the high priest, it was the same thing too. It was God that set up the office of the high priest 
God called Aaron to be that high priest and God commanded to be his descendants. But at the same time, that high priest was one that was ordained of men. Okay. It was it, man. You know, it was God that authorized it, set it up, but man was involved in setting up the high, next high priest and doing all those things that went into that. And that's just the way it is when it comes to certain positions. And some positions are to be given by man to one who's proven worthy. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 18. It says, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. This was something that God ordained. This is something that God wanted. You are going to pick people out. And later, God, and in other passages, God gives certain qualifications, and they are going to be over you. They're going, they going to be judged. Nobody just goes along one day and says, I'm a judge, and then judges. No, you are appointed that position by men. Uh, Exodus 18.21 Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge, uh, they shall judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear thy burden with thee. So we see these appointed positions. And not just anybody was allowed to do it. Um, look at Acts chapter, or um, yeah, Acts chapter six and verse two. It says, then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Okay, those first deacons, they were chosen by men. They were appointed by men. They were ordained of men and they had a specific role that they served. Now I'm telling you all this because us as Americans, we have this attitude that people can just do whatever they want, be whatever they want, proclaim whatever title on themselves they want. That's not the way things are supposed to work. Some jobs are for specific people and God, in many cases, you know, God gives the requirements for those things and we should never step outside of those things. And when it came to the high priest, God was very specific about who could be a high priest. And it was supposed to be a descendant of Aaron. So understand when he's talking to Jews here, that a Jew is going to have a huge problem with you saying that Jesus was a high priest when Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. They weren't like Americans where just anybody can do whatever. Okay, They understood the law. They understood how God had set up certain people. So him saying this is going to cause a big question for them. And so God talks about in verse four says, and no man taketh this honor unto himself. Okay. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus did not just declare himself high priest. That's not what Jesus did, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. You know how Aaron got that position? God called him to that position. That's how Aaron got it. God called him. And you know how Jesus Christ got the position of high priest? God called him. God called him to that position. And so look at verse 5. It says, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So we need to understand, you know, communities, all right? Communities are groups of people who have something in common, have always assigned different responsibilities to individuals, you know, so they could take care of things on behalf of all the people. Because that's what the high priest did. The high priest, he did many things. He did many offerings, many sacrifices. He did many uh, washings and cleansings. He did things himself that he would do on behalf of all the people. So this was a special role. Okay, Not just anybody could go do these things, but it, these things needed to be done. They were requirements of God. And so there was one person that did it on behalf of everybody. And don't we do the same thing today? We have people that we have assigned to do different things on behalf of all of us, whether that be a mayor, whether it be judges, whether it be even police officers. As a community, we assign people different responsibilities. They just don't do it themselves. Okay, I don't just get to declare myself mayor. I can't just you know grab that honor for myself. I have to be put there by men. And we have a process for that. We have elections. 
Okay? And I can't just declare that we have an election tomorrow. Okay? We've got rules. There's, you know, there's terms that need to be fulfilled. There's a process that you've got to go through. Civilized societies have always had these things. We'll talk a lot more about this on Sunday. But understand, I'm telling you this because we, we forget about this, but even today, we have people that do things on our behalf. Okay? If we have somebody that executes somebody, do you understand why we aren't the ones that pull the lever, why we aren't the ones that killed that person? That person that did it, did it on behalf of all of us, all right, of a specific community that they represent. And that's what a high priest did. You've got to get this if you're going to understand Hebrews 5, 9, all right? So it might sound like some boring stuff, but you've got to pay attention to all this stuff, okay? I'm... I'm Treating y'all like typical Americans today who don't know the first thing about law and, and you know, justice and how, how things work and structure. Okay. But at the same, so as a pastor of a congregation, there's things I do on behalf of the whole church. Okay. As you know, there's things that, uh, they're, they're kind of my responsibility that I do for the whole church. And when I do these things, okay, if the church is taking care of my needs, if I'm being paid by the church, I believe all of you take part. And that blessing, it's the same thing too. You know, if we're supporting a missionary, okay, when we help, you know, support that missionary, make it possible for him to do work, he's doing that work on our behalf. And we are blessed by that. And a lot of the th things that the priest did, pretty much everything a priest did, he was doing those things on behalf of all the people. Okay? So... The things that I do, though, as a pastor, have nothing to do with salvation. Okay, I don't do, I can't do anything that helps you get saved or anything like, or that causes you to get saved. Jesus did every bit of that. Jesus did all of that. But the works that I do, I believe, are are credited to all those who enable me to do the work. Anything that you do that enables me to do the work of the Lord, I believe you take part in the rewards of that. So. Keep, keep all those things in mind. So in the case of the high priest, God specifically called Aaron and his descendants to be the high priest. And then later, God called Jesus. Well, who was it before Aaron? Melchizedek, right? God is the one who assigns these positions. And God called Jesus. So look at verse 5, okay? Because Jesus did not appoint himself says in verse 4, no man taketh this honor unto himself. Nobody is allowed to just declare themselves leader over, you know, a large group of people. Now, a dictator can do that, I guess. But is that what God ordained? Is that what God has called us to be, dictators? No, that's not how it works. I'll talk more about that on, you know, dictators probably on, on Sunday. But look at verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So um, this would confuse the Jews, once again, because Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. So right here, Paul is quoting Old Testament scriptures, prophetic scriptures. He's quoting scriptures that they would be familiar with to show them that, hey, this is legit. This was prophesied. It, in Psalms 2, uh, in verse 7, is where it quotes the, um, you know, thou art, or, um, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's Psalms 2, 7. In uh, Psalms 110, verse 4, that's where you see, you, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. So he's pointing them back to Old Testament scripture, showing them, hey, I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. This isn't something new I'm giving you. This is what was prophesied. This is what we've been waiting for. Jesus Christ is that high priest, not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. So, uh, so look, uh, so Jesus, uh, he, you know, he will forever be the high priest for two reasons. Because it said thou art a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek. Why? Well, because one, in Psalms 110, verse 4, he called him to be a priest forever. That was God's calling on Jesus Christ to be a priest forever. And even in the Old Testament, the high priest was a high priest until he died, wasn't he? So that means there can't be another high priest until Jesus dies. Well, that's not going to happen. 
So he's showing them here. Once again, you're not completely, you're not abandoning your old ways. We're continuing on with what was, what you've always done. We're just in a, we're in a new phase. We're in a new era. We no longer have an earthly high priest. We have a heavenly high priest and his name's Jesus Christ. And he's legit. Even though he's not from Levi, he's after the order of Melchizedek. It was prophesied in Psalms that that's exactly what would happen, that he would be a priest forever. And Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He conquered death. He's never going to die. So we are, we are never going to look for another earthly high priest. Jesus Christ is our high priest. That's what he's trying to get across to him right here. And you say these details are boring. They were absolutely necessary to explain these things to Jews. They understood structure. They understood law and how these things worked. And so he's showing them here that Jesus Christ as a high priest is not a violation of any law. This is what was prophesied. This is exactly what we've been waiting for. So look at verse 7. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, talking about Jesus, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus' work as a high priest, it was something that he was called to do that was against his will. Okay? What Jesus was called to do, to be a high priest, to do the work of a high priest, it was against his will. It says in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplication. Why would I say that that was against his will? Well, turn back to Luke chapter 22 and verse 41. Luke chapter 22 and verse 41. You say, well, you know, how could Jesus have not wanted to do something that God wanted him to do? There's a very good reason for that. It says in Luke chapter 22, verse 41, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So, did Jesus want to take that cup? Did Jesus want to do that work? Did Jesus want to endure the cross and despise the shame? Well, yes and no. No, he didn't want to do it, but he wanted to do the will of his father more than he wanted to do his own will. So, yeah, you can say you want to do it, but you can say you didn't want to do it. When it came to his will, I mean, he's holy, he's perfect, with, and, he's, and God's telling him, I want you to bear the sins of the world, to drink the cup of sin. Someone who is holy in the days of his flesh, who has holy flesh, is not going to desire to drink the cup of sin. Somebody who is holy and has holy flesh is not going to want to bear our sins in his body. But notice Jesus was obedient and he prayed. He asked, Lord, if it be possible, if there's another way, let, you know, let's take that way. However, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus did not want to do it. But you know what? He was obedient, wasn't he? He obeyed God. God's will, the Father's will, was different than the Son's will in this situation. But Jesus was obedient. He did what God wanted him to do. And so, um, look at verse, uh, go back to Hebrews, or I'm sorry. So, this, you know, this situation, all right, the whole thing where he's in the garden, where he's praying, you know, he, where he's sweating, as it were, great drops of blood, okay? Well, you know, let me read a few more verses. I, I, I stopped too soon. Um, verse 43, it says, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Why? Because he was about to die. This weighed on him so much. You know, he's, I mean, he's in agony. Look at verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. What's going on here? Jesus didn't want to do this. He is in agony thinking about what he's got to do and what he's about to go through. And the stress was so great, he's sweating great drops of blood. 
I can't imagine that. None of us have ever done that. I, it's a real thing that can happen to people. My wife was reading about it the other day online. I forgot what it's called, but I mean, it's, it's a real thing and it's a serious thing. And Jesus, his, his soul was sorrowful. He was nigh unto death. It almost killed him thinking about what he was going to have to do. Think about that. Because we often, we don't want to do what God wants us to do because it's just going to make us uncomfortable. It's going to cause us to miss our TV program. It's going to cause us, you know, just a little bit of stress. And so I don't want to do that. And we disobey God. And when we disobey God, what are we doing? We're giving into our flesh. Jesus Christ, he's not, his flesh did not want to do this. Okay. Not because he was sinful. That's why you and I don't want to do what God wants to do. He didn't want to do this because he was holy, because he was without sin. But do you understand? This is what gave him an opportunity to be obedient to something that was against his what he wanted to do. And that's why he's a high priest that can you know, not be touched with... We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Now, I've faced some pretty big temptations before. Okay, I've gone, you know several days without caffeine and you know that it, I started getting the jitters, you know, and I gave up. All right. I mean, I've, I've gone through some temptations before. I mean, we've, and I, I'm, I'm being funny here, but th- think about the little things that we give into all the time. Now we've, we, I've had to do things that I just didn't want to do. I mean, I didn't feel like it at all. The thought of doing it, it made me sick. Maybe, maybe I made me want to throw up, you know, gave me a bad feeling in my stomach. But you know what? I have never been so stressed out. I've never been so tempted to not do what I was supposed to do. I was sweating drops of blood. I've never been that tempted before with anything. Jesus was that tempted. And yet he was obedient. And so he knows temptation, okay? He knows what we're going through. He understands what we're facing. He knows what temptation is like. And so that makes him a great high priest. And that specific situation was key because of the fact that this, what, you know, he was holy. Okay. When you're holy, you want to do right. Don't you? When you're holy, you don't want to sin. You don't have a desire to sin. So how can he understand what temptation is like when he has no desire to sin? Okay. Well, by God telling him to drink the cup of sin, and to take the sins of the world upon him. That is what weighed on him. That was what uh, caused him to sweat great drops of blood. And because he did that, he is able to be that good high priest. So God's laws and God's will, they go against our will, don't they? But we ought to obey him anyway. Look at uh, four, uh, chapter 4, verse 15 of Hebrews. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like... As we are yet without sin, he knows what it's like. He understands temptation. And so there's, uh, there's, you know, he's able to do that job. He understands it. He's qualified. He's got experience and he was successful in it. But God's laws and God's will go against our will, but we should obey it anyway. Philippians 2, 8 and 9 says, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Do you realize that being obedient to somebody, it's humbling, isn't it? You know what you're saying? When when somebody tells you to do something that you don't want to do and you do it anyway, you know what you're saying? I recognize their authority. I recognize the fact that they are above me. And it it is a humbling thing to do that. Jesus Christ did that. He humbled himself. We've got, we've got something going on here. God wants me to do this. I don't want to do that. But you know what Jesus said? I'll do what God says because he's the father. He is the authority. And he humbled himself and became obedient. And that's exactly what we ought to do in our life. And unfortunately, many times uh, we don't. I'll do what I want to do. I'll do what my flesh feels like doing. And we just give in to every little temptation But Jesus Christ did not do that. And he went and he went to the cross. And why did he go to the cross? He was going as our high priest. What does that mean? He was going on our behalf. He was going and paying 
for our sins for us on our behalf, being the high priest. Remember, the high priest would do things on behalf of all the people. Jesus Christ, he went and paid for the sins of all of us. And that's, that's why he's our high priest. So look at verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 5. It says, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What he was about to explain to them here, it was going to be difficult. Okay, And when it gets to you know chapter 6 and 7, where he's really getting in deep with this whole priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, he's telling them here, this is going to be hard for you all to get this. And the reason it was going to be hard for them to understand what he was about to teach them was because they didn't understand the basics. He's like, you all don't even know the basics yet. You're unskillful in the word. You're unskillful in the word. And therefore, this is what I'm about to tell you is going to be hard to understand. I've had people before, too. They've asked me some of these hard questions. And you know, maybe when it comes to Bible prophecy or something. And they'll, they'll want to ask you, you know, explain this one verse to me. And I know where these people are coming from. Okay. I understand the doctrine that they have been taught. I under, and it's like, you know what? I, I can't give you a simple answer to that because you don't understand the basics of Bible prophecy. Before I can answer that question to you, you know, I have to unteach you dispensationalism. I got to show you where you're dead wrong and all that stuff. We got to go back to all these first principles. And that's how it is with a lot of people in the, in the prophecy world. They, they don't know the basics. They don't understand certain things. You know, when you're just saying seven year tribulation, seven year tribulation, and then, you know, and they want to call us mid tribbers all the time because of what we want to believe. It's like, you know, you got to start from scratch with these people. You know, show me one verse in the Bible where the rapture comes in the middle of the tribulation. Well, I never said it comes in the middle of the tribulation. I said it comes after the tribulation. But unfortunately for you, you're so dumb, I got to go back to the beginning and I got to teach you that, you know what? There's nowhere in the Bible that it teaches a seven-year tribulation. And a lot of these people too, you know, they throw out these arguments like that in a tweet or something. And it's like, you're supposed to respond and answer that question in a tweet. It's like, no, I got to go back to first principles with you. You're wanting this deep stuff, but you don't know the basics. So how am I supposed to get this across to you? And what's about to happen here in these next chapters is whoever the writer of Hebrews is, he's about to go into some pretty deep stuff. But he's like, you don't know the basics. So this is going to be hard for you to get. You're unskillful in the word. You know, you need the milk. And that's where a lot of people are at today. And that's why a lot of people don't understand certain things. And I do. It's just, I, I get questions all the time. Sometimes people send me an email or they'll leave a comment. And, you know, and they'll ask this really hard question. Or it's, it's not even a hard question, but it's like when you know where they're coming from, it's like, man, before I can explain algebra, you've got to learn addition and subtraction. And... You got people today demanding answers for some things that are pretty difficult and they don't know addition and subtraction. And look, let's go ahead and look at chapter 6 real quick. Look at verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection or completion, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands of the resurrection of dead and of eternal judgment. You know, he's, you know, he's saying, you know, let's go on. Let's, let's move on. Let's learn the next thing. Let's not have to lay that foundation. You know. But unfortunately, you have to many times because so many people, they don't know the basics. And if you don't know the basics, you're not going to get the deep stuff. And when it came to Jesus being the high priest, he had to, he had to share this with them. It was, the, it was the truth. It was what Jesus was. But these people did not know their Bibles very well. And so it caused them to have all kinds of questions that 
if they knew the Bible like they should have, they'd have had the answers. It, it wouldn't have been difficult. And often new believers do that. They ask questions about things hard to be explained. And the problem is they just don't know the basics. And sometimes you just got to go back to the basics with, with people. So anyway, that's what he's saying, right? That's what he's saying here in these last verses. All right. And he admonishes them in the beginning of chapter six. You know, we need to, we need to move on. We need to go. I, I need to be able to show you these deep things and, ex, and explain these things. And that's what he does. So now what about verse nine? Okay. What about verse nine? What is that all about? And I got to be careful with how I word this here. All right. It's very important. I, I hope I word this right because I, I definitely don't want to send a wrong message. And this verse right here, this is one a Calvinist would love to use. Uh, a Calvinist could use this to their advantage if they wanted to. And a dispensationalist could use this to their advantage if they wanted to. Because it says, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation and all them that obey him. It says obey. What could that be talking about? Because because if obedience is a work, you know, then salvation is by a work, right? Well, what is it that I have to obey in order to have eternal salvation? I've got to obey the gospel. How do I obey the gospel? Well, we learned that last week. Basically, stop working. Okay, stop working. But it, it goes a little deeper than that. So. What have we been talking about this whole message, okay? We've been talking about a high priest who does things on behalf of everyone else, okay? Not just anybody could go and do those sacrifices. Not just anybody could go into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could do it, but him doing that, it was done in behalf of everyone else, okay? The high priest was the one being obedient. The high priest was the one doing the work. But it, what he did, it was for everyone else. That high, high priest position, it was held by someone who was called of God, ordained of men to do a work on behalf of the people. And in the Old Testament, the people, they would often show their obedience by bringing the sacrifices and offerings to the high priest. And then the high priest would take those things and then he would go make an offering for them. Okay, he would do it on their behalf. And we don't have time to go back and look at all these things that the high priest did and all those offerings, but those are great studies because they are a picture of what Jesus did for us on our behalf. Jesus Christ is all over in, the, in those things. So, uh, you know, he, when we got saved, what offering were we told to bring? We weren't told to bring any offering, were we? Because the truth is, salvation's free, right? It's a gift. We were not told to bring an offering. We were not told to do any works. What were we told to do? We were told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we were told to do, to believe on Him. We were told to have faith. And when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, you could say that I was ordaining Jesus to do my work on my behalf. You all see that? When I'm saying Jesus is my high priest, I'm saying He did the work for me. I didn't do the work. He did the work. I didn't obey. He obeyed. He was the one that was obedient. All I've been told to do is basically give it to Jesus Christ. I've been told believe on, to, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the truth is, when I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, when I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, my obedience is accomplished through what Jesus did. So it's kind of like, you know, in a basketball game, all right? Have you ever heard some, saw somebody, they were watching a basketball game and their team won and they said, we won? Well, you didn't do it. They did it, all right? But, and it's kind of the same thing when it comes to our salvation. Yeah, I obeyed. Yeah, I did it. Well, how did I do it? I did it because of the fact that Jesus Christ is my high priest. He did it for me. Hey, as a country, you know, when our, our president does something stupid, okay, it's on all of us. Why? We picked him. We put him there. You know, we, are, we ordained him to that spot. We elected him to that spot. And you know what? It's not just his fault. It's the whole country's fault. 
And if we have part in that, because we ordained him or we chose him, it's the same thing. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, we obeyed through his work. He did it on our behalf. So what did I do? How did I obey? Well, I didn't really do anything, but my high priest did for me, didn't he? And so just like if I go and you ask me to do something and I say, I'll get that done for you. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll wash your car for you. But then I have my son do it on my behalf. I ordain him to that position. If you thank me, that's, that's not inappropriate. I'm, I'm the one you could say that caused it to get, caused it to happen to get done. When it comes to my salvation, when it comes to that, the work that it took to save me. Okay. Yes, I did it. I obeyed. But how did I do it? By believing on Jesus Christ. By accepting him as my high priest. And then he went and did every bit of the work. So it's not a mistake when the Bible says obey right there. I obeyed through Jesus Christ doing the work on my behalf. That's what a high priest does. So guess what? I get credit for it. When Jesus Christ died for my, when I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, God now saw me with Jesus' righteousness. I now have his righteousness. How did I get that righteousness? I didn't do it, but Jesus did do it, didn't he? Jesus did the work for me. I am credited for being obedient. Even though it wasn't me that did the work, Jesus the work. Is, is, am I explaining this? Is this clear? I haven't confused any. All right. Some of you look like you're getting it. Some of you look like you might be a little confused. I had to beat my head against the wall a few times before I find, I finally got this down. So we are, we're told to have faith. When I put my faith in Jesus Christ, you could say that I was ordaining him to do the works on my behalf. And there was a whole, and a whole lot of work went into my salvation. A ton of work went into my salvation. A ton of work went into my salvation. Yep. I did a ton to get saved. Yep, I, I did all kinds of things to get saved, but I did it through the one I have put my faith and trust in, Jesus Christ, and in reality, he did it all on my behalf. And it counted for me. His work, his righteousness is imputed unto me. Why? Because I put my faith and trust in him. It was all done by my high priest, Jesus Christ. And so what the Hebrews needed to do was they needed to accept Jesus Christ as their high priest. They needed to stop looking at earthly high priests. They needed to stop looking at, you know, priests from the tribe of Levi. And you know what they needed to do? They needed to now trust Jesus Christ as their high priest and say, he's our high priest. I want, I want his work that he did for me. I accept his work that he did on my behalf. But unfortunately, many of them, many of them kept wanting to do their own works. And the truth is, we obey, the way we obey is by ceasing from our labors. We saw that in chapter 4. And trusting in Christ's work as, as high priest. So that's what, that's what we've got to get. That's why we've got to understand these structures we have in our societies and communities. We have people that do things on our behalf. And so we get credited for those things. And Jesus Christ did all the work of salvation, but he did it on our behalf. So I get credit, you could say, for being righteous. That's why God sees me as righteous. Why? Because my faith in Christ, it was me appointing him, accepting him as my high priest, and he went and did every bit of the work. And just understand, if you try doing any work, to get you saved, you try doing any of the roles a high priest, it's not going to work. You're unqualified. You can't just declare yourself high priest. And that's what people are doing when they're trying to work their way to heaven, trying to get to heaven through their good works. People who think they're going to go to heaven because they're a Baptist or a Catholic or whatever, you know what they're doing? They're ordaining themselves. They're taking a position upon themselves that was not given. God ordained, he, or God called Jesus Christ to be that high priest. And all those who have, you could say, ordained him, 
and have assigned him full responsibility to get us do the work to get us into heaven, have righteousness, and we were obedient through that alone. We were obedient through his work, not our works. So when you see all the verse in the Bible that says not of works, not of works, not of works, and you see that one verse that says obedience, you've got to understand the context of it. It's because of the fact it's explaining how Jesus is that high is, is our high priest. And we have we have made him our high priest when we believed on him. So it's not a contradiction. It doesn't prove a work salvation in the tri tribulation for the Jews. Jesus Christ is our high priest. Hebrews applies to us today. And so I hope that was helped to you. I hope that was clear. So with that, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for being a high priest, Lord. We thank you for your obedience, Lord. Without your obedience, there's no way we would have a chance of going to heaven, Lord, because we've all been disobedient. We've all fallen short. But Lord, what, a, what an amazing thing it is that you went and you did all of our work, but you did it on our behalf. And to think that we get credit for it, Lord, it's, it's, it's a humbling thing. But God, I thank you for that. It was the only chance any of us had. I pray you'll help us to, uh, to learn from this, Lord. And I pray you'll help us to follow your example and not give in to all these little temptations that take us down all the time. But uh, you'll help us to look to you for an example whenever we're, we're fighting temptation. And I pray you'll give us the victory. In your name we pray. Amen.